Welcome to the Private Podcast, hosted by Derek E. Silva and brought to you by Orchid, the crypto-powered VPN that keeps your data private and allows you to explore the internet freely. Welcome to the first episode of Private. We are excited to feature Edward Snowden's incredible keynote from Orchid's recent digital privacy summit on how to fix a broken internet. He shares his thoughts on the purpose of privacy, surveillance capitalism, and the importance of being anonymous. Enjoy the show. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for this very special event right at the beginning of uh, our conference. Pleased to introduce uh, Cindy Kahn from the EFF and, of course, Edward Snowden. Looking forward to hearing Ed speak for a little while, and then we'll be switching into Q&A. Cindy, do you want a quick introduction also? It's really hard to think about how to introduce Ed Snowden. I, of course, like to think of him as the person who gave me evidence to prove what I have been suing <laughs> for a very long time. But that's pretty personal. I think that, you know, Ed really opened the eyes of the whole world to the links to which the you know national security argument had been used to really drive a huge hole through our privacy and security. And I think we all should be indebted to him. But he also thinks big and he thinks big about the Internet and the future of the world. So I'm very excited to hear what he has to say to us today. Thank you. Without further ado, over to you, Ed. Thank you very much to you both for the uh, introduction and for the opportunity to speak with you today and for everybody joining us. Uh, really, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you. It's one of the blessings of technology, despite all of the difficulty that it's introduced to our lives collectively and, of course, to my life individually. If there is one tyranny that we are overcoming, it's the tyranny of distance. So thanks for inviting me into your home or on your trip with you, whether you're in the car or on the bus, whatever. So the, the topic for the conversation today is supposed to be, um, you know, how we fix a broken Internet. We need to begin on that by thinking, well, what's wrong with the Internet? Uh, you know, it's faster, it's more connected, it has all these wonderful things. Yeah, but when I think about the Internet structurally and the challenges that it's facing, they really do go deeper than that. I think in the abstract, when I was younger, uh, and for those of you who remember earlier forms of the internet, the internet was really an expression of the aggregate of individual interests and desires of small communities that were knit together by people looking for the like-minded. They were actively courting them. They were trying to invite people, persuade them to look at the things that they're interested in and to share. And I mean that share in a pure sense. It was really given away. There weren't a lot of commercial interests in the earliest expressions of the Internet. I wrote in my book, Perm the Record, that what I saw was the replacement of a creative and cooperative network with something that was commercial and competitive. In that book, what I describe is not just, you know, people see it as like a biography. It, it, it's not really the story of me. It's the story of the time. It's a dual biography of the changing of technology, but more centrally, the changing of the system that borders our lives. And I believe what has been produced in the time since. Uh, when we talk about what's wrong with the Internet, we have to talk about what's wrong with the world. What has been constructed is a system that is fundamentally unfair. What do I mean by that? Look at economy. There is an increasing concentration of resources into fewer and fewer hands uh, in every demographic, every chart you look at, every measurement. That leads us into politics because economy is what provides influence in politics. I think in many of the world's most important countries, uh, whether we're talking about the developing world or developed democracies, as we like to term them, the result is really the same. Voting choices are engineered so that Regardless of the outcome, nothing will fundamentally change. Okay, a popular quote. And then that's really the problem, isn't it? What we need, uh, what even you know, children in, in, in Sweden recognize today, is fundamental change. And this brings us to culture. It brings us to media, discourse, expression, uh, community. This is the broadest of the, the subjects that we uh, sort of contend with here, but it's also the easiest to evaluate in short by simply gesturing broadly to it and saying, you know, when you look at being what's being discussed, when you look at how it's being discussed, who is discussing it uh, and the impact that it has 
uh, the results that it's producing, the impact that it's having on our lives, are you encouraged by what you see? And you notice that none of the things that I mentioned are technical, uh, despite many, many, many problems in the technical domain, like that little mass surveillance issue uh, that you may have heard about. This is to say that the internet is broken because it reflects a broken society. Unfair systems uh, produces a byproduct dissatisfaction, uh, and, and therefore they're typically hard to maintain by historic standards. Right? You can maintain over a generation. When you start getting multi-generational, they start to lose their authority. They start to lose their legitimacy. They face insurgent challenges, right? And eventually they're unseated. As our Economy, politics, and even culture uh, have sought in the modern moment to reduce access to an equal role in our common franchise, right? Resentment and grievance have blossomed to the point that now every discussion has become an instrument of war by other means, right? This competition is everything and it's everywhere. But who is it that competes, right? For, for all the breathless talk of uh, radicalism and the increase of extremes, which do exist, they are out there, they are happening, I see very little in the way of this blood sport sort of spreading as a kind of contagion amongst banks. Right? As far as the average worker should be concerned, the largest political parties in any given election and any given country tend to be two different brands of the same Pinkerton. Everywhere that matters, Prices go up uh, while wages fail to keep pace. Institutions, governmental and corporate have borrowed and spent the wealth of a generation that will never enjoy its fruits. And what are you going to do about it? You see this happening. It's not uh, you know, advertised, but it is apparent. If you are the average person, you know, you're, you're going to write a hilariously mean tweet about it, uh, about someone that you don't like, you're going to impose it on them. You're going to pick the target of hate and you're going to express that hate. And then you're going to post a picture of yourself uh, in contrast, looking extremely cool on Instagram. You're going to do these things from a device that you paid for, but you don't truly own using apps that answer to just about anyone who is not you. And for what? For the likes. Uh, everything is for the likes. It's for the approval of peers. It's in pursuit of that brief, shining moment that we can leave this you know, uh, decaying hellscape behind and be elevated to the attention of those that we care about, the attention of the proud. You know, and, and this is to say that the Internet is broken because institutions are competing against the individual, while the individual competes amongst itself. And this is by design. Competition is everywhere, but only amongst the powerless. We are set against each other in a thousand ways from morning until night. We are encouraged to perform in this daily talent show, talent show where even when we win, the only reward is the, the drumming of faraway fingers on a little red heart icon. Meanwhile, there is no competition at all amongst those who rent out the stage upon which these little dramas that represent our lives are, are played out on. You know, the, <laughs> the little dramas of their lives, these little people called we. From ad space to electricity to bandwidth to rent, we pay and we pay and we pay. We pay for the privilege of competing in a contest that society cannot win. I think the this unfair system that orders our lives has identified rightly that the dissatisfaction it produces, the dissatisfaction of the masses can be managed by way of distraction. And by and large, the internet has been instrumentalized to affect this. It can be done by distracting us through necessity. Um, it can be done by uh, distracting us through entertainment, which is actually one of the most effective ways because people appreciate it. Uh, it can distract us through division. Uh, division of identity are amplified all over the place. I think to maintain a focus on individual privilege 
in order to overlook close to entirely, I think, issues of generational privilege. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I know a lot of people out there are like, oh my God, he said the P word. It actually does matter. It is, it is real. What do I mean by generational privilege? If you think about what I mentioned before, that uh, earlier internet, everything that I did when I was uh, the youngest of young men has been forgotten. Those records aged off. They were ephemeral. We were generationally privileged to be able to experiment uh, without being worried about it ruining our lives. You know, the old bad tweet that gets so many people canceled today. Uh, exploration was not only encouraged, but the system relied upon it for the furtherance of the, uh, you know, borders and boundaries, the, the settled area of the Internet uh, domain. And then over time, bit by bit, as that domain expanded, as more value was created and produced by the network effect and by the people who were settled uh, in this new intellectual space, bars to entry cropped up and consequences began to crop up, not just for the worst things that we did, but also for some uh, legitimate things. And as that has happened, as that has become systematized, as that has become automated, as we have been profiled, as everything we click on, everything that we search for has been padded out into this automatic dossier, perfect records of private lives for every given person who hasn't done anything wrong. They have simply interacted with a system that cannot be avoided, that is necessary, that underpins everything that we do. The consequences, the bars became too high. The results of curiosity, of expression, of exploration became uh, too dire uh, to risk. And I think this has turned us inwards and it has made us uh, sort of more of a uh, sloganeering uh, population where we see things that other people said and then we affiliate ourselves with the tribe and then we repeat it. And then if we make a mistake, if we say something we, that we don't like, we have to double down. We have to defend it, even if we don't agree with it, even if we evolve beyond it. Uh, because to admit mistake is to mis uh, admit error. To admit error is to basically announce wrongdoing. And this wrongdoing can never be you know, forgiven en masse. And it certainly cannot be forgotten. You know, if you were the age now that I was then when I was growing up on the Internet, uh, you are disadvantaged on practically every axis, every prong of interaction with this system. Uh, anonymity is harder if you want to look something up and don't want it to uh, be traced back uh, to you. It, it, it's difficult to kind of shelter your routes of inquiry. Pseudonymity. Uh, is discouraged. Uh, private identity in general is culturally looked down upon now, uh, seen as unseemly, or I, I think even in, in many contexts, harmful. And we need to think about uh, where that leads, uh, because the other P word that I haven't mentioned yet is privacy. What is the purpose of privacy? And why is its loss on the internet so damaging? Because privacy is what protects that right of inquiry that leads to progress. You know, when we talk about privacy, the privacy right, there's always somebody out there, you know, uh, verbally retweeting. If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear, which originates from the actual literal Nazis and their minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels. But the reality of privacy is, is that privacy was never about something to hide. Privacy was about something to protect. Privacy is the right to the self. It allows you to be different and distinct from the majority. Rights in general don't exist to advantage or protect the majority. The majority doesn't need them. The majority decides the laws. The majority is what the system protects, generally. Rights uh, are the only prong of the system that protects the minority against the majority. Why do we do that? Is it just because we're nice? Is it just because we've uh, sort of evolved so far uh, that we can be, become uh, benevolent? No, I, I think in a coldly practical way, it's because the people who write the rules in many countries uh, had to go through a revolution in order to do that. They had to exist for at least a moment as a minority, and that opened their eyes to the fact that it is the differences amongst us that provide those seeds of progress. Um, if you stand with the majority, there's tremendous good you can do for society. It's not to say, you know, having a majority opinion uh, to be a normal person, to be the average of the average, uh, is in any way uh, undesirable. But 
when you have a difference, when you think differently, when you see differently, when you speak differently, when you feel differently, when you just want to try something, when you want to see how something works out, if that is dangerous to you, if that is risky, if that is harmful to you, you are disincentivized to try it. And then society has lost something um, meaningful because that is our only way to break from the orthodoxies of history, the way that things have just been done, are done today and have always been done, and to try something new. Most of the things that people do differently are not valuable or not useful or not good, or they could actually actively be harmful or bad. But particularly when they're done on an individual level, particularly when they're done on a small level, they are the engine of all human progress. They are what drove us out of the swamp of history to what we have today in the spaces that it's better and worse. But when we talk about that language of privacy, the privacy right, insofar as it's constructed by reading into the penumbras of the, of the Constitution in the United States and elsewhere, sometimes fortunately more explicitly around the world, we have to recognize that all things that belong to an individual derive from privacy. It's the reason we call it private property. Uh, it means you have a stake on something, even if only your own mind, your own self, your own soul, distinct from the claims of society. Now, <laughs> when we entangle that with the internet, well, we start to entangle that with the systemization, the quantization of everything we do. When you turn your car on, like most people, even in this quite technical audience, uh, who buy a new car are not cognizant of the fact that the car is a phone. It has a cellular radio built into it that costs the manufacturer only $40 a unit that will tell them you know, when your car needs to come in for service, it'll tell them how fast it's been going. It'll tell them where it's at. It'll allow them to turn it off and take it back in the case uh, that you don't pay your lease. When this happens at an individual level uh, of an individual event, an individual appliance, you know, it can be concerning, but it's not, uh, you know, existentially threatening. When it's everything everywhere, when it is all electricity, when it is all devices, when it's when we go out on the street, when it's when we drive an old car that was manufactured in like 1955 and has like big old crazy Buick tails on it, you would think that, you know, then you wouldn't be tracked. But now we have automated license plate readers, uh, everything else. We have facial recognition that's happening everywhere. We have biometrics that are spreading everywhere. And more and more and more, we have demands for proven identity that are asserted at every interaction with, again, that ring of institutions, uh, and again, regardless of their um, industry, regardless of whether they are corporate or governmental, if you look over the fullness of time of the last several decades, really, you, know, you can start to get into hundreds of years, you'll see that the institutions feel a greater sense of fraternity, a greater sense of kinship, greater ties of identity to other institutions than they do to you into the public at large, into society writ broad. And this, I think, is the central problem uh, that we are facing. We have been, as individuals, uh, we have been, as a society, atomized, fragmented, spread thin, and uh, really harried by a thousand demands and needs and requests for attention, for decision, at the same time that all of the things that are most consequential in our lives, the way we're tracked, the things that are determining uh, whether we get a job, whether we get a loan, the thousand little algorithmic decisions that decide what pops up on your news feed, uh, what the next thing on the timeline is that showed to you, and what thing is next concealed, uh, these happen sub rosa. They happen under the table. We are not aware of them. And increasingly, not just because of politicization, uh, but also because the Mark Zuckerbergian dictatorial model of internet service platforms where we have these uh, centralized decision-making silos uh, that order literally uh, and influence the attention and decisions of billions. How do we influence them? How do we rescue our seat at the table uh, of government, of, again, really the, the franchise of directing our common journey? If you look at the world today, you know, does this represent your will? Is this what you want? Is this what you signed up for? You know, do you feel well represented? And it doesn't matter whether you're on the left. It doesn't matter whether you're on the right. It doesn't matter whether you're in the center. Most people would probably agree things don't look that great right now. But then you ask the next question, what are you going to do about it? Uh, and a lot of people answer with a dot, dot, dot. 
Uh, and this is one of the things that I'd like to uh, go to now in the questions is uh, we should talk out not just uh, my answers, although I'm happy to share them, but also from Cindy and Stephen. What should our answer be? How do we confront these challenges of a quantified world where the individual is electronically naked to the point that they might as well be physically naked? We are transparent before power. At the same time that structures, institutions, again, this could be government agencies, the CIA, the NSA, that are reinterpreting the law in new ways that we can't see, we can't vote on, we can't uh, control, and even Congress has very little interest in this. They are opaque to us while we are transparent to them. And the question before us for the rest of the session, I think, uh, in addition to whatever else you have, uh, is what are we going to do about it? Uh, So let's go to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Wow, that's very deep. And it's really, I think, a very granular analysis of the statement we hear a lot nowadays, which is that if everything's free, you know, like who's the product and and what is the product? Well, we're the product. And so I think really breaking that down and understanding how either by design or by circumstance, which is effectively the same thing, we now have uh, a system in which we're sort of players in a game and what is the game that we're trying to win? And like, what's the, what's the point of this all? Like, what do we get to at the end of our lives? We've got, how many followers did you have? And how many people <laughs> yeah. you know, appro- approved of what you posted or didn't approve? Or was your life ruined? Did you get canceled? I mean, there's all these kind of weird sort of phenomenons that I agree with you. I, I was also you know, kind of very early in the internet and remember the days before it was, you know, like using Mosaic when it was like back in the day, I was using things before there was Mosaic. And it was just such an interesting exploration time. You could find things. And when I was doing my research, it was just fascinating to connect with people in different parts of the world and feel free to say something. And well, that's gone. Like I can't even find some of the things I, I, I would like to find that I, I did in the past. And I, I'm a big fan of sci-fi myself. And it is quite a sort of dystopian reality that we're, we're, we're stepping into. One of the things that I've, I've thought for a long time and one of the reasons why I'm so focused on both the, the advocacy around privacy and the technological aspect of what we can do to, to build tools that allow people to be more private and, and less censored is the idea that sometimes I feel like if we don't get this right, what I think is right, we may end up in a point where there's kind of a point of no return. And especially once you start add, add AIs and all sorts of other kind of tricks into here, you think, well, hang on a second. One day you wake up and you're like, how do we undo this thing? Maybe we don't know how to even organize to protest against it. Because if we try to organize to protest against it, then we get you know, reprimanded or we get we don't even need to get locked up anymore. We just get like socially locked up, that kind of that sort of thing. I have a bunch of questions and Cindy and I worked on some questions. I think perhaps it's more interesting just to kind of go through this conversation and see where these, these questions come up. Let me jump in just to follow on kind of what you're uh, talking about, because I, I know Cindy has been interested in this in the past. Cindy's work with uh, EFF, you know, has really blazed the trail for a lot of the thinking um, that the community has in these spaces. You uh, were basically skating along the point of the <laughs> right to resistance, as it were. And this is what I was sort of thinking about as I went through my remarks. As the world becomes increasingly quantifiable, um, as you know, the uh, transits of every given person from morning to night, because they've got a phone in their pocket, and even if they've got, you know, location services turned off, the cellular provider um, still knows exactly where they are, what towers they're connected to. They know the associations and co-travelers, the other phones uh, that move from tower to tower at the same time, from place to place, and this just goes on and on and on. Uh, they know who you call late at night. They know who you call after you visit the hospital. They know you know which of your parents you call at the low point of your life, uh, and they know where you go next. Do you travel? Do you you know visit another hospital? Do you uh, research something you know on the internet? What kind of uh, query do you submit? What provider does it go to? What record records do they have? They know the the most intimately private things that can be known really about us. And what they do not know with certainty, because they have a record of it, uh, they can infer with greater and greater confidence as as time goes on. This is just what's out there for the taking. As you said, the the, the product uh, is us, which I I, I think is not quite right. Uh, It's close to it. It's what people say. The product really is our uh, attention. The thing that is on offering is a space in front of our eyes. They're trying to intermediate 
our ability to perceive and to think and ultimately to decide. Uh, what's being sold is influence um, writ large, I think. Then there's this whole other space, of course, which is uh, the offensive space, you know, how things are being hacked, how governments are intentionally keeping the Internet less private uh, and less free uh, than it could be, and not just them, but other institutions as well, um, in order to maintain their own advantages uh, in being able to spy on us effectively. Uh, why are they spying on us? It's not really to stop terrorist attacks. Um, in the large part, they do do this, at least attempt to do this. We know, for example, the case of 2013, uh, the cases that they said, you know, oh, these were useful for saving lives when uh, the government itself actually went in to investigate. They went, no, these programs didn't uh, have any effectiveness in stopping terrorist attacks. They weren't uniquely useful. They didn't save lives. But they did provide us sort of warm fuzzies. They gave us more awareness. They added to our information dominance, as it were. But I want to go to Cindy and, and just say, uh, from your perspective, from all of your experience, from all of your work with the FF, and just looking at this from all sides, because, uh, you know, you've gone much deeper on the corporate side as well. Uh, what's happening here. Are you concerned that there is like a drop dead date where it becomes less possible to organize and sort of shift uh, the system as it exists, the system of law, the system of uh, just norms and practicality? Or do you think, you know, we, we always have this, we don't need to be afraid of this? Uh, and I'm not just asking like the positive vision question to get you to say, you know, sort of the, the warm and fuzzy platitudes that we do as a community to motivate ourselves to continue uh, working forward. But we know things are getting harder in different ways. We're not going to give up. We're not going to see the field. We're not going to stop fighting. But what are the linchpins in this big system that government is using for surveillance, that corporations are using for surveillance uh, that have made them so defensible? Uh, so hard to unseat. What are we doing about them that they can work and what are we not doing that we should be doing about it? I mean, I really love your insight about how the corporate big players and the government big players are now kind of aligned in knowing everything about us with us having very little ability to know about them. And, and I see that all over. And to me, that's one of the biggest issues is this, uh, especially in the, you know, the national security context, the, the opaqueness, right? The lack of the ability to have any democratic understanding of what the government's doing, much less the ability to control it. And seeing that kind of reified and crustified and, and made harder and harder to break is, I think, one of the real important insights that kind of feels geeky, you know, transparency and national security, you know, uh, the state secrets privilege, but really is the linchpin to the idea that we have a democratic system. And I think the other things that become a piece of that, when you think about it, they all come down to democracy and personal power, right? If, if we're unable to really vote and the, the elections, as you say, are really two flavors of the same thing and there's no way to break through that. That makes it really hard. It makes it really hard for for anyone to break out of that because the vote is one of the ways that we can change course. You know, I think that in the in the United States right now, you can see a pretty big effort by people who don't want to change course to try to limit the way people can vote um, so that 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 can't happen. And around the world, we're seeing efforts as well, you know, the growing authoritarianism and the difficulty that the forces of democracy are having to try to 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 have influence and change course. And, you know, to me, it really does come down to the shrinking number of places. You know, the Internet wasn't designed to just have five big companies and five, the five eyes, the five big, you know, <laughs> governments of the world really, you know, calling the shots about what the rest of us got to do. In fact, it was designed exactly the opposite. Right. The idea that that, uh, you know, you could take down one node and the rest would survive. Right. The kind of old DARPA story about the Internet. You know, true or not, that's you know, I think we all in the 90s at least thought that was uh, right. And to see that shrink and shrink and shrink is um, 
is is disturbing and 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 to see all the different ways in which that is shrinking. So I don't know that there's a clear moment, but those are the things I look for to see when things are shifting. Um, you know, in the United States, again, I'm an American lawyer. We have three branches of government. Are those three branches of government serving as a check against each other, or are they just confirming each other? Um, and I, I worry that 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 we're we're headed into the latter instead of the former, which was the the idea. What other sources of of, of power? and authority are there that we as individuals can harness to change change direction. Now, you know, the good news is I believe that humans are amazingly innovative. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting right now, I mean, we're at this conference for ORCID is, you know, people really digging back into the internet and trying to redistribute things, trying to make power go back out to the edges instead of the center, a resistance to this you know, idea that platforms are these, you know, pillars where they can control everything, but really more talking about protocols and interoperability and how do we do that in a privacy protective way, which, by the way, we can. I think those are, you know, that's where you take heart. We take heart. And especially, you know, uh, you know, the original think different, you know, idea, you know, came from Steve Jobs, but it was attractive to a lot of people because I think the early people on the internet, especially, they didn't really fit in and they were looking for ways to <laughs> yeah. go together and and hit the, yeah. and, and, and build things and build community. And so, you know, the nice thing about that is it wasn't that long ago. We can get there. You know, Moses didn't come down off of stone tablets and say there will only be Google, <laughs> Apple, Facebook, Amazon, yep. and Microsoft. Um, so luckily we can we can redo that. But it it is going to take work and it's going to take recognizing things. And sometimes I think sometimes people are kind of a little like the boiling frog, right, where it's hard to see what's happening um, or it's overwhelming. And people give up and they they engage in privacy nihilism. There's just nothing I can do. I'm just a tiny, insignificant thing. So there's nothing I can do. Both of those are dangerous ways of thinking. And there are lots of people who would like you to think that way. You know, hopefully our job is to try to help people, you know, see their power and, and feel it in these. So let me actually follow up on that real quick uh, before we go back to Stephen. One of the uh, interesting things to me is this question of, all right, what if it fails? Right. Um, what if the system is uh, too organized and uh, it's the um, public at large is too fragmented uh, on their part in order to organize, to resist and make effective changes, particularly given so many political institutions that they don't really care about uh, public opinion um, in general, uh, unless it's actively applied, unless it's really laser focused in a, a persistent way. I do think that privacy nihilism is too popular. Um, it's too easy for people to look at the capabilities and the potential for violence, particularly as these uh, capabilities improve, right? Uh, you start thinking about uh, automated infraction detection and you know, arrest and enforcement. Eventually, there is going to be a government in the world that is going to try <laughs> uh, basically judicial algorithms um, instead of judges. Uh, they'll start on the small scale. They'll start with, you know, the, the pettiest of the petty misdemeanors. Uh, we already, in a way, do that with speeding tickets uh, from speed cameras. Um, but as people become more comfortable with that, as uh, governments feel more confident with the defensibility, you know, we start to go, oh, there's nothing we can do. You know, all that's lost. We need to retreat in ourselves. And, you know, you see the great minds of a generation basically going off to a cabin in the woods in Massachusetts or whatever, and like, you know, rededicating themselves to carving canoes. I really do think that is too pessimistic in, in many ways because we already see the, the funny thing about technology is it is a magnifier of power. Uh, and what happened with the Internet, the you know, enormous renaissance that it brought about uh, early on was governments basically sucked at it. Um, they weren't imaginative enough. They weren't organized enough. Uh, it was really academia and uh, where there was government. It was government scientists and researchers who were looking at this and extending this. Um, those people in government who were creative and cooperative, who were all their relative power, which generally was quite small uh, in the world and in their institutions, suddenly was amplified, right? And this creative force became much uh, larger um, in, in real terms, right? But nominally, 
the power even this great crew here had when it was multiplied by let's call the internet just a factor of 10 for you know ease of imagination uh, they were now 10 times stronger we have 10 more academics right we have 10 more you know times the number of government scientists that are interacting uh, and it brings about this little short golden age right but then the long tail of corporate suck right and government uh, comes in and they're much much larger their uh, power is now magnified by the same 10x, right? And the actual relative distance between the two groups, the smaller group and the larger group, has actually increased, right? Because if you multiply 1 by 10 and then you multiply 10 by 10, uh, you now have a distance not of 9, but of 90. Uh, however, there is a cap on how much mass influence you need, on how much uh, just on this uh, sort of imaginary table of potential to influence that you need to change the world, right? Uh, you don't need to have 100,000. You don't need to pin the needle. Uh, you know, if the whole of academia represents on this new scale of 10, right, and an individual might have been, you know, a fraction of one, maybe an individual over time has over more, uh, you know, advances in technology, maybe they get up to one, maybe they got up to 10, maybe they get up to, you know, 100, maybe governments up in the stars, you know, they're like, you got to write in scientific notation. But once you get past that threshold of local influence, of community influence, of national influence, and global impact, you get some weirdo, like a Satoshi Nakamoto out there, right, uh, who writes a paper and he shares it with a bunch of other weirdos on a cypherpunk's mailing list. Uh, and over time, now you have something that is actually an existential threat because we talked earlier about how is this unfair system maintained? Well, if governments raise taxes too much, everybody gets dissatisfied. You know, you start to have resistance. They might go, oh, can we maintain the system in this way without restructuring or rejiggering in risky ways? But what if we just borrow instead? What if the government writes itself loans and then basically writes these loans off to a generation that isn't even born yet uh, or to everybody else through a self-tax through means of inflation like that? If they keep doing this, if they keep playing games, if they keep writing checks that other countries in international trade don't want to cash, right? They don't want to keep loaning money to this treasury or that central bank. All of those things that we take for granted, uh, the structural elements, the pillars of the status quo, uh, start to crack. They start to fracture. Uh, and if you look at the value of something like a Bitcoin, right? Over the last year, we see the rate of change. You know, these things continue to march on. They gain uh, more supporters. They gain more adherence. And it's not that Bitcoin is going to eat the world necessarily. Uh, Bitcoin is great. It's amazing in many ways. It sucks terribly in other ways, for example, like financial privacy. These things can be changed. You know, Bitcoin can get better. Competitors can rise and do better. But the reality here is the way that government funds itself the way that institutions make ends meet. Uh, these are structural weaknesses in their own systems of influence uh, that we take for granted as eternal. And if we start moving towards dark enough futures, people, just individuals at small scales can pick up their ball and go home. And we've seen this happen time and time and time again throughout history, particularly when it gets to things that hit people who are apolitical very personally, like uh, exploitative taxation. Uh, Stephen, I, I don't know if you want to respond to that or want other questions, but uh, <laughs> the floor is yours. I just had a, one thought around, I've studied the situation in China quite carefully. One of the things, I'm not sure if, you, if you've been aware of, around the marketing of surveillance, the, the idea of the algorithmic um, automatic infraction detection. There was a, a famous crossing in Shenzhen, um, which I guess, you know, they said had a lot of people getting knocked over in uh, crossing the road and so on. And so they started this campaign where they showed people, well, listen, what we've done now is we've got AI that detects whether somebody didn't stop at the red light or not. We automatically find them on their phone through Alipay and WeChat and so on. And, and they, they use this to promote the idea of surveillance. They say, look, surveillance is good. We're helping you. This is good sure. for society. For the majority of people, this is a good thing. So therefore, you should like this and you should want this in your lives. And I thought that was a fascinating twist of, how to kind of sell surveillance to a society. And yeah, that's just one thing. Really this, isn't actually, this isn't actually new to us. Uh, we have had it in the United States and most of the developed Western world uh, for ages. 
through the whole save the children argument, right? Uh, or the counterterrorism argument. Uh, what you're describing is just marketing, right? And the new government initiative. Uh, and they find something that people are universally against, like running over people in crosswalks and uh, sort of holding that up to poster child uh, to justify the authorities. But there is always how that authority is used, you know, openly in public under the spotlight, and then how it's used uh, under the table. Um, and that's that's really gets to the basic question of public trust in the institution of government as it exists in uh, a given moment, um, and the legitimacy of that government. Uh, government can use uh, terrible capabilities for good purposes. The thing is, uh, even if you can come up with a justification for it, right, is it consistent with the values of what a society wants to be? In some cases, it is, right? In some cases, it's uh, you use a, a minor intrusion into a right, uh, particularly when people are aware of it, particularly when they consent to it. Uh, for example, somebody putting like a security camera sign on the doors of the gas station that you go into because they get robbed all the time, right? Uh, you're aware of it. You don't particularly care. You don't have an especially large uh, privacy interest in that. And if you do, you can go, you know, maybe I'm not going to get gas here. You know, maybe I'm going to go to the old place down the street um, and pay cash. Uh, those probably don't even exist anymore. I've been gone a long time. Um, but, uh, there, are, there are cameras everywhere now. So, so okay. Very, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and every pocket and every hand. And especially for, um, my, for my, my home country, the UK, we have more cameras for us than anybody, I think, at this point. I mean, I think another argument that is important and beginning to gain a lot more credence in the area of AI is is actually recognizing that, you know, there's this kind of technology is magic kind of story that I think a lot of us have have, have heard over and over again. And, and, you know, so to me, it's especially interesting and important that the people who are talking about bias in AI, the people who are, who are noting that, you know, if you put an AI on top of an unfair society, you're going to amplify the unfairness, right? You know, the AI doesn't know what truth is. It just knows what you've done in the past to a certain extent. And so, you know, on the one hand, there's the, as Ed points out, like, you know, you need to have knowledge, open consent, a lot of control, a lot of transparency around these kinds of things. And the other thing is you have to be clear eyed about you know, how these technologies work. And we're so far from that at this point. And you know, it kind of drives me crazy that one anecdotal story about somebody crossing the street would, you know, engender the kind of support that a clear eyed view of all the costs and benefits, you know, what, a, what an actual self-governing society ought to do is actually look at, you know, how many, how many people yep. were saved by this versus what else happened to the data versus all those kinds of things. And then you can make an informed societal decision. Um, but we tend to be governing by anecdote a lot. And um, sometimes those anecdotes are really dangerous. Yeah. And they're especially dangerous in a diverse society where your experience of of say how the AI might work in recognizing your face might not be the same thing as an African-American person has that AI might actually make them less safe. I'm just talking in generalities. We did have one question from the audience that I kind of wanted to talk a little bit because I know anonymity is something that's, you know, near and dear to folks in this heart. And the, the question was, you know, should we continue to be anonymous or do we really need to reveal who we are in order to speak up. And I know that's a, a actually a question you face pretty directly about it. And I'd, I'd love to hear, because I think people are struggling with sometimes when you're doing this kind of work, you do need to think about your threat model and whether your identity would be, could, could increase danger to you or others or whether it couldn't. And so I thought I would ask you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is really an individual choice and that's the central thing there. It needs to always be an available choice. Uh, because it's different for everyone. When I was in Hawaii, uh, basically gathering evidence of crimes by the you know most powerful government in the history of the planet, and trying to secretly coordinate with journalists in order to inform the public, without getting caught, so the story couldn't be stopped. Right? These journalists had no training. They had no understanding awareness. Uh, the NSA had these capabilities. Uh, they didn't know how the federal government was going to investigate. They didn't know. Uh, particularly back then, how trivially easy uh, it was to hack an identified system, you know, just send an email with a phishing link to one of these guys that were popping back then. Uh, so I had to, you know, do the best I could 
to kind of train them generally to use things like the Tails operating system, to use things like Tor to, to route their communications, which was enforced by default on this, which is why I made them do that, to use PGP so we're not just on Gmail, you know, sending things in the clear to anybody who, you know, can uh, stamp a warrant, basically, or even worse, a subpoena in many cases. But even with that, uh, there was no way that they could protect me because they didn't know the risks. Uh, it was hard enough for me to try to protect myself. And so the only way that I could coordinate with them, the only way that I could communicate with them, the only way that I could risk giving them information that could put me in jail for the rest of my life, and very likely, or was most likely to put me in jail for the rest of my life, was for them not to know who I was. And this protected them, it protected me. Like If there was no anonymity possible, it would have been very difficult for me to justify taking that kind of risk. Um, and this was with, even with me knowing there was basically a burning fuse where I would uh, regardless be identified. Uh, my identity would be discovered. I would be known, right? Uh, but I needed that space. I needed that moment. We needed to be able to carve out uh, just a few weeks in the year that we could talk in confidence with each other to discuss, is this something that the world should know? They ultimately agreed that it did, and that the rest is history. Uh, and we succeeded. You know, the NSA uh, found out basically when it hit the news, or, or very shortly before. But not everybody's in that situation, right? Not everybody wants that. Not everybody needs that. But for those who do, it should be available, and it should be much easier. You know, you shouldn't need to, you know, be a former CIA, former NSA, whatever, uh, in order to talk to a journalist in confidence about something that you believe uh, is of vital public importance. Uh, and if we lose that, in, in many cases, we already have. Um, it's very, very, very difficult to maintain meaningful anonymity, particularly against these top-level actors. Though it is still possible, uh, it requires a level of technical sophistication that in many cases uh, is unfair uh, to just presume that any arbitrary member of society uh, should be able to you know, clear this bar. It's tragic that the situation is where it is, where things like anonymity, things like privacy are becoming either luxury products uh, or perks that are only available to an expert class. Um, and we very much need to uh, make that more egalitarian, make that more universally available. On the other hand, is it required? Is it necessary? Should we all be in anonymous all the time. I, I don't think uh, we need to. And I, I think uh, attaching your name to something does provide a, a mark of credibility. That's why, uh, in large part, I came forward. Uh, well, so the government can't simply say this is made up or whatever, because I knew they were immediately going to charge me uh, with you know, a whole buffet of felonies, which they did. Uh, and they can't now say, oh, he made it all up because they go, well, you know, we charged him for <laughs> basically uh, taking these documents. So obviously, they came from somewhere. But this gets back to something else, which, uh, Cindy, I know you've had an interest in, um, which is when we talk about public discourse, we've talked about so many other things. We've talked about uh, economics. We've talked about politics. We've talked about, uh, you know, culture generally. So much of culture is intermediated by platforms. People do not talk to each other directly. They talk to each other through Gmail. They talk to each other through Twitter. They talk to each other through Facebook, through Instagram, whatever. Uh, there are gatekeepers everywhere. And really, just in the last few years, basically since the ISIS social media craze, all these social media companies, all these platform providers have become more comfortable uh, with acting as censor, with deciding the things that can and cannot be said. Uh, and they started with, again, things that are pretty easy cases. They go, we don't want to show, you know, uh, videos of innocent people being lit on fire, or beheaded or pushed off of buildings or whatever. But that's crept and crept and crept and crept and crept uh, until the line for permissible speech uh, has really become a wave that is in motion. And it, it's constantly narrowing. There are new uh, classes of sort of impermissible speech every day. And the way these companies have, to this point, uh, begun to resist complaints about them censoring or it being arbitrary or, you know, them picking and choosing things that can and can't be said, uh, Facebook especially, has, like, proposed their own court. Uh, what is your opinion on this idea of, like, the court of Facebook? Um, 
Uh, you know, where, where does this lead us? Is, is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? Does it work as a fig branch? Is it just garbage uh, or fig leaf? Um, and just how do you see that the, the position on freedom of speech of these companies, how they're sort of dodging that and where we should be? How have we moved from the Internet of speech or the Internet is a platform for the absolutist position of freedom of speech, which is the answer to bad speech, is more speech, which we've had for ages, uh, to this new thing of, you know, deciding who and what gets censored and where and how do we just scale censorship? It's a real tough problem. I think a couple of things are fairly obvious at this point. Um, one is that content moderation at scale doesn't work. They suck at it. They're always going to suck at it for reasons that um, I think are pretty, pretty um, not too hard to see. And that the way they suck at is going to follow power. You know, I think there's a lot of attention being played to some extremely powerful people who have been, you know, kicked off Twitter and Facebook. But that's actually not the bulk of the people being kicked off of these things. Most of the people who suffer getting kicked off of these things are people without power. And it's as a society, we tend to focus on the powerful people in everything that we do. Um, but in this particular instance, I think it's really can be misleading because it can lead you to think that that's the whole problem. The whole problem is whether it was okay for Twitter to kick off uh, or Facebook to kick off uh, Trump, which is what the Facebook board is looking at right now. I think that that's really framing the problem incorrectly. Ultimately, at the end of the day, I mean, the Facebook Supreme Court is never going to operate at scale. It's not going to be able to operate at scale. So I think it's going to end up being relatively unimportant in the conversation. You know, I kind of understand where you would come up with this and there's some good people on it, but I just don't know that that's the right way to think about it. To me, if we really want an Internet where uh, free speech lives, we, we we can't just have it with five platforms. We, we need distributed conversations for both sides, both so that people can say what they want, but also so the communities can kick out people who are destructive. And that doesn't mean, you know, you can't do all the other things that you might not to do on the internet, but you might not be able to go to the bowling conversation anymore. If you keep talking about racquetball, like that's okay. (laughs) Or you might not be able to go to the conversation. You know, people just might not want a Nazi in their midst. And so they're going to kick you out. That's okay. And it's okay in a world in which there are many other, lots of other options, lots of places for people to see for so that, Really, the rather than Mark Zuckerberg deciding or an algorithm deciding or all of those poor people who have to look at all that awful stuff all the time who work at Facebook for very little pay, the first step needs to be to make that not the place where speech, the, the only place where speech happens and move it to smaller communities that can have more control. I think Reddit is a good example of a community that really had a, a, a problem and did some things to make it much better um, because it really built on the community ideas. Now there are hardline rules there and I, I don't want to say they're perfect, but you know there are ways out of this problem that are speech more friendly and speech less friendly. And I think we need to pay attention to them. Ed, I had a question just as we close towards the end here. I was actually at a talk you gave at uh a small conference, uh, one of my investors, and I remember you left the you know people who are founding companies and so on in, in this space with um, kind of a call to action of you know, please don't just focus on you know building these things and trying to make money, but like try to make a difference. These decentralized technologies have the potential to give us a different kind of internet, as, as Cindy was just talking about. How do you feel today, and, and can you sort of? Give us some some thoughts as to, you know, in your words, like what you think is important for us to be thinking about going forward as builders of this new technology. When you think about all of the things that we've discussed today, uh, the ills of society, uh, how those are reflected and manifested uh, through the Internet and really just the uh, automation, the instrumentalization, uh, the operationalization, operationalization of um all of those things and how they're expressed to maintain the system, right? When we hear phrases like national security, we need to understand what they are. They're, they're, the national security is not protecting you and me. It's not public safety, where they say public safety. These are not about uh, policing actions generally. It's about protecting the stability of the system. In the old days, we used to call it state security, which was a little more honest. We need to recognize that everything that we do interacts with these systems that are larger than us. Uh, And they will be co-opted and they will be used by these systems for their own intention. And we need to think about uh, the fact that what we've lived through in the last half century 
is basically the greatest redistribution of power in history yet seen. I think the individual uh, has been made more legible to powerful uh, forces, to centers of power than they have ever been in history, right? Uh, you go back to like the Stasi, whatever, whoever your villains of history are uh, with their great surveillance. Uh, and they didn't know a damn thing. Uh, it was absolute garbage uh, compared to what one social media company uh, can know today about any given person. Not just their users, uh, but the people that their users connect with, right? Or someone like if it's at the scale of Facebook. Facebook just bakes their SDK, their software development kit, into your weather app or whatever. You just want to get crash analytics or something, but they leech everything out of that phone. What we are doing is we are building architectures of oppression. In many cases unknowingly, in many cases unwittingly or unintentionally, or simply because we did not care enough or because our imagination failed, right? Uh, and I think what we need to do is look at these structures uh, as we design them and think about how they can be used for the betterment of people, capital P people, people broadly. One of the most uh, encouraging things about like the uh, cryptocurrency space and everybody who's building on these different chains is that they understand the value of decentralization. Everything that, you know, Cindy just described, everything that we've been dealing with uh, today, we're talking about the concentration of power, the concentration of resources in fewer hands uh, that increasingly do not need to be answerable to the public, but is that the public has lost meaningful levers of applying consequence, right? One of the interesting things about the movement towards greater decentralization is it rejiggers all those levers. Um, we no longer need the same levers for consequence if the sort of options for abuse on the other side are diminished. And this is something governments really haven't done a great job catching savvy to recently. Like I, I think um, Jerome Powell just uh, a day or two ago was like, you know, Bitcoin is not really a threat. Uh, to the dollar or fiat currency, it's uh, you know more of a, a competitor with gold. And like if you kind of squint your eyes and look at it sideways, um, you can get to the point that he was trying to make. Uh, but really, he's missing the the forest for the trees there. Whether it's gold, uh, as it has been throughout history, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's puka shells, whether it's something else, if government money, if corporate credits. If centralized platforms fall out of favor for a decentralized authority, uh, one that has no central authority, all of the privileges of the modern world that it grants, that it invests into central authorities, uh, will begin to evaporate. Right? And that is a very different world. And uh, speaking frankly today, it is very, very far away uh, what it appears to be. But when the movement begins... It can happen very quickly. And I think all of us, and particularly the people working in this space, they design, they engineer, they build, they decide the moment that that movement begins. And I think uh, given the direction that the world is going um, today, it's natural to recognize it's risky. It's natural to recognize that it's disruptive. And in a lot of ways, it will be unjust. Uh, but we also have to ask ourselves, what are the consequences? What are the costs of inaction, of failing to move, and of perpetuating a system that we know and itself admits is unfair? Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Cindy, for a very entertaining um, and interesting and a very thought-provoking session. Thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure uh, to be with you. And I, I got to say, for everybody who you know sees these things, for everybody who's far away, you know, uh, sitting in their bubble, I, I think I, I'm, I've still got these social distancing crown. Uh, but uh, you know, everybody sees these things nowadays in this crazy world and all this instability. And they're like, oh, you know, uh, stay safe, stay safe. Yeah. Particularly in this community, we've got to be comfortable recognizing that there is no freedom from risk in a free society. Uh, if liberty is a state of potential, of freedom from permission, being able to act without someone saying, okay, you can do this, there are people that will do great things with it. There are people who will do bad things with it. There will be people who are trying to do a good thing, and it, it just goes sideways, right? 
we have to have the risk of failure. We have to have the risk of consequence uh, because risk is the seat of consequence. Or sorry, risk, <laughs> risk is the seat of progress. Uh, also consequence, consequence can be good and bad. But this is why I say, you know, whenever we close out one of these things, um, don't stay safe, guys. Stay free. Thank you. Thank you. You just heard the private podcast with your host, Derek E. Silva. Remember to subscribe to the show on Apple, Spotify, Google, or your favorite streaming platform. New episodes available every Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in.